Welcome to the Brandy Show, Conversations With. The idea for this type of show came from the very concept of podcasts. They're available to anyone at any time since they stay posted on the internet portal and definitely podcasts that are time sensitive that deal with issues of the day are fine, but after a month or so, they can be out of date. Taking advantage of the technology, it made sense to create a program podcast that would last. It's as current the day it is posted to six months or a year from now. Hope you like our series. Thanks for stopping by. Today, my conversation is with longtime Detroit Lions assistant coach Don Clemens. Believe it or not, Don came to Detroit back in 1985 when Daryl Rogers was named head coach of the Lions. For the next 27 years, Clem stayed on the Lions staff until 2012 through nine head coaches, numerous frustrations, and great triumphs in a career he wouldn't trade for the world. He's still at it, too, coaching American football in Europe and at a Division III college in Pennsylvania. You'd think after 27 years in the NFL, those jobs would be a step down. Not for Don Clements. It's a game he loves and a profession he can't get enough of. He's the perfect guest to discuss all things football, especially the Detroit Lions. Here's my conversation with Don Clemens. So 27 years with the Detroit Lions. Don, you do not look old enough to have coached 27 years with the Detroit Lions. And you've been out for nine years or seven years, haven't you? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Seven years, Jim, as a matter of fact. But So how come you don't look older? You should see it from this side of the market. <laughs> <laughs> I, I may not look that old, but I am old, and I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're still coaching football. Yep, as, as much as I can. You know, uh, as you know, Jim, I go down to uh, a little school in Pennsylvania, Moravian, and I'm from that area, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So I go down there because it's, it's fun. My son went there for two years, and, of course, they talked me back into coaching. And uh, my wife stays here in Michigan. I go down there, and they give me a house, and I live in this house with two 25-year-old guys who try to get me to go out at night with them. And I said, guys, I'm 65. I don't go out at night anymore. I go to bed. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning, though. Uh, for those folks out there who are Detroit Lions fans, you came to Detroit from Arizona State. Correct. With Daryl Rogers. Yes. Yep. Daryl and I were together for... Uh, I was with Daryl for nine years, five years at ASU, and then four here in, in uh, here in Detroit. And you know, he just passed away, I think, this year. Yes, he did. And uh, tremendous guy. I mean, a little misunderstood sometimes, but a tremendous guy and a really good friend. He was he was a great guy to work for. And a darn good football coach. When he was at Michigan State, he brought that program back. Yeah, and he was experienced with taking programs out of probation because he did it at San Jose State, and uh, with the same AD. And then he did it again at Arizona State after Michigan State. So um, he followed Joe Kearney to three different places, and that's kind of his reputation of stabilizing the boat, you know, and then uh, getting it going. And make no mistakes, at, Mich at Arizona State, we had some really good players when we got there. And that was Daryl's line. And he used to say, hey, guys, don't say anything bad about Frank Cush because he's a good guy. And he says, and look around at these players. Don't screw them up. <laughs> <laughs> Best advice a coach can give, right? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. When Daryl came to the Detroit Lions, mm -hmm. uh, what was your thought uh, at coming from the collegiate level to the NFL? Well, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was pretty nervous. And I, had a, I was thinking about staying at, at uh, Arizona State, and then John Cooper came in. And I talked to him for briefly for maybe 45 minutes or so, and I realized then that I, I kind of should go because he had his own guys. And uh, ASU had, had said, look, we'll put you in administration if you want, if you want to stay. And, you know, you're going to Michigan where it's, it's snowing and raining, and you're in Arizona. <laughs> it's, when, it was 80 degrees at the point when I came up here to talk to Daryl, you know, here in uh, Michigan. When you got to Detroit from the uh... – collegiate level mm -hmm. what kind of a transition was it for you to go to the nfl and why didn't daryl work at the nfl level i mean he was a wonderful coach wherever he'd been like you said he took people out of probation the nfl is a different animal why didn't daryl's abilities if you will translate into the nfl i i think a little bit had to do with the fact that not knowing what a professional football player is and how they how they act, what they react to, 
had a lot to do with it. Daryl was really good um, with with people, but with a large group of people. Um, and when you're dealing with professional athletes, and you can't keep giving them the same speech. When you're in college, you rotate guys through every couple of years. Well, especially in those days when there was no free agency, your team was your team for many years. And I think um, you need to have people who are dynamic all the time. And Daryl kind of would get into his routine of doing things and Hey, that's why he was successful. But in the NFL, I think you really have to have somebody who can adapt all the time as the leader. And uh, Daryl's game in college, his passing game was really, especially when we first went into the, you know, when he came to the, to the Big Ten at that time and then went to the Pac-10, we were a little bit ahead of the game. I mean, he really had a great passing game lined up. Got to the NFL, really, that's the passing game we had. So we were just starting in neutral, I guess. And uh he did a good job initially because the players really responded to him. And then as we went on, I think he's better with a real veteran group of, of guys. If he had a veteran team, I think we would have been a little bit better because, you know, when you have to develop players, it's, it's, it's more difficult. And you really have to be aware of the, how to adapt and do things differently. But uh, uh, great guy to work for, though, I will tell you. And, you know, we had, we had some bad luck, too. You know, we had, um, you know, we weren't very good. And sometimes it's hard in those days, Jim, as you know, without being able to, to trade for guys, to get pick guys up in free agency, it was really difficult. And uh, Monty did a heck of a job before we got the job. And at the end, he lost Billy Sims. Well, you don't have a running back anymore. It's awful hard to win. What kind of talent? Was that the issue with Detroit all along in your early years here? They just couldn't get over the hump from a talent perspective? Yeah, I think I think we were – we were just starting to build, I think, when when Daryl left, when when he was let go. Um, you know, we built the defense. We had some good players. We had Benny Blades. We had we had Chris Spielman. We had we had some good linemen that we had brought in, and defensively we were getting better. And you know, William White was in that group, uh, and so we were just starting to really get going a little bit. But we were struggling on offense, and then. Then came Barry, and that changed <laughs> the whole scope of it. Well, and, and also Wayne. Yeah, well, that's when Wayne. That was Wayne's first. Right, because Wayne took over for Daryl. Yes, and yeah. you stayed on, and, and and that's the other thing that's amazing about Don Clements is that you went through nine coaches, I think, in Detroit, wasn't it? That's true. Seven full timer and two uh, <laughs> two interim coaches. And and, so. and the point is, is that is rare indeed, because usually a head coach comes in, and you know you'll have one or two guys on the staff that are held over. True, but through nine guys, Don, to go twenty seven years. I got to tell you, you're a survivor, baby. <laughs> Somebody called me Lazarus once. So I don't know. I don't know what that means exactly. But no, what happened was, you know, I was Wayne's basically uh, since I was a defensive assistant. I was Wayne's assistant coach, so he knew me. So it was easy move for Wayne to keep me, and I could help the new guys coming in to to kind of coach them up about Wayne. And so, uh, yeah, that was. I don't. I don't think Jim it'll ever happen again because everybody's in such a hurry now. Well, and it can be with, with, like I said, free agencies changed the game, you know, whenever that happened, 96 ish or so. Uh, it's really changed the game because you can build a team a little bit faster. And, you know, you get some good draft choices. Naturally, you got to have a quarterback, but you have chances to get players in free agency as long as you stay under the cap. And, and we didn't have that early on. And when that came in, that really changed it. So, as far as a guy like me, uh, Coaches come and go really fast now. You, I mean, look at it in Arizona. Last year they fired a coach after one season. I mean, that's almost unheard of. In the old days, you'd go four years for sure. You know, you'd get four years. So, um, and really for me, I, I was I was the, the, the most flexible guy on the staff, and I think that's what people saw when they came in. I coached all the positions on defense at one time or another. Um, I did all the – I could do all the film breakdown and things like that. So – it was easy to – if you're going to keep a guy, you want a guy who's not in a – you know, you can't keep the coordinators normally because they've been in a position of authority. I was always like the – I used to call myself the janitor of football, and I think the guys <laughs> who would come in, they'd think I was a janitor and it was too late to fire me after I was there for a couple of weeks. So. Oh, you're, you're, you're not giving yourself enough credit there. But go back to the idea of Wayne because Daryl leaves, Wayne comes in, and Wayne was a different animal altogether – in how to deal with 
I think, professional football players. He had experience with John McKay, I think, a little bit, yes, too. Yes. And that helped him. But Wayne, I mean, he painted a bullseye on his back, calling himself the big buck as a, an assistant to Wayne. Did you see that coming in that style working? Well, he was such such a good communicator with the players. And really, um, you know, sometimes he was underestimated as a coach. He's really a very good defensive coach, very smart guy. And uh, and he was really good with the players, and the players loved him. And, you know, they talk about they you play for a coach. Well, I don't know if you ever really play for a coach, but he was one of those guys that you, you didn't mind being around, and the players liked him. So I feel that, you know, it really helped him later as, as we went on. And as you remember, early in his, his head coaching career, we would struggle until about Thanksgiving. And then we would turn it on. A lot of times we won the last four games. Next thing you know, we're in the playoffs. And people don't realize how many times we were in the playoffs in those years. And um, he took a lot of heat. Remember they used to have in the old newspapers, they have a poll on the front page like, should you fire Wayne Fonts? <laughs> and I used to laugh. I said, we won 10 games. They want to fire us? But, you know, eventually they're going to get you. But Wayne was a really good coach and, and, and obviously a very gregarious guy and um, funny guy. Funny, really funny guy, you know. So, uh, yeah, very enjoy and very easy to work for. He and, really was. And Barry came along during Wayne's years. And as a coach, have you seen anything like him before no, or since? No. And, and, and you know, Jim, the, the coolest thing about it is you'd see him in practice. He was the same way in practice. Now, naturally, you don't ever hit anybody in practice, but you still have to go full speed during your team period as much as you can. And he would make some moves, and you go like, how did he do that? And you'd see, you'd see that the look almost on his face like he was saying, I wonder how I did that. And, you know, Jim, one day I asked him, I said, Barry, and he used to call me Mr. Clemens. So I call That's, him. Uh, isn't yeah. that Barry, the quintessential Barry Sanders? Yeah, and so I call him Mr. Sanders. Anyway, what he would do is I, I said to him, I said, Barry, how how do you how do you do that? How do you run? What do you what are you thinking? He goes, he says, you know, I'm really not sure w- what what I do. He said, but I know where everybody is, and you know what? When he ran, if you think about it, Jim, he did. He, it almost looked like hey, you make a left hand turn, and why? And there, then you see two guys coming from the right, and you go, oh. But he, that's how he was, and very humble guy, tremendous person, tremendous person. He told me once, he said, I've never worried about making the first guy miss. It's always the second guy I'm worried about. And I always used to think about that and say, so if you see a guy ready to tackle you, it's like you're not worried about him. It's the other guy. And he goes, yeah. And I'll never forget the best thing I ever saw, John Lynch against Tampa. Yes. Yep. Remember, he oh, yeah. was a safety. He filled this filled little – it was a little cutback play. And here's this all pro, maybe Hall of Fame safety, yeah. standing there in the hall all by himself. And Barry walks up to him about a yard away, and John Lynch never laid a glove on him. Nope. 80 yards. <laughs> and I had to say, well, and he made guys turn around. Remember the Dallas game yeah. and the New England game? That's what your comment was about how he probably didn't know what he was doing, but he always had that vision to know where somebody was. Yeah. And I think he also knew how they were going to react to a move. You know, there's some Jim. I'm, I I don't disagree with you there. And and what a it was remarkable to watch him. I mean, and I still remember uh, Jimmy Jones came to joined our team at tight end. We got him in Plan B or something from Washington. And so his first game, we're playing the Bears, and Barry made this. We're playing in Chicago. Barry made this run, and he he like got spun into this pile and came off the top of a guy. That was and, the one where he was stopped, right? Yeah. Yeah, and he that was the ESPN play of the year, and that was the first game of the season. And Jimmy says to me after the game, he says, is he always like that? And I said, yeah, he's, <laughs> it's only a matter of time. Don't worry, it's only a matter of time. Interesting thing, too, because Wayne coached Barry a lot of years. Then Bobby Ross comes in, and that's the year Barry gets 2,000 yards. Yep. And Bobby Ross was as a guy that, let's face it, uh, has a little bit of a dark history here from many of the fans. Yes. But yes. he was the guy that coached Barry when he got the 2000. Yeah, and and I think that was a, I think that's a little bit of a mistake to think that Bobby was the reason for any of that stuff because I don't I don't think I think Barry in his mind said I'm going to play X amount of years and I'm going to be done. And then plus the Walter Payton deal, who he really admired. I don't think he, and, and records didn't matter to him. So I think it was just time for him to go. And 
I wish he would have told us earlier because I would have got his autograph because I've seen him since then. But I mean, I would I don't have anything that's autographed by Barry. You going, kidding me? No, nothing. Do you remember the Monday night game in Dallas? Yes. Uh, yes. We were playing in our throwback uniform. Yes, we were. Yeah. There was a picture. I had to stay overnight, and there was a picture the next day in the Dallas Morning News. Barry making a move. I know the picture. And and the carpet is is bubbled is up, behind, bubbled his up behind his foot. And I looked at that and I went, "How can that be? This is a carpet on a yeah field. How can he put that much torque to actually ripple that carpet?" I said, "I called the paper. I says I want that picture." I got it, and I actually have Barry's signature on it. Well, that would be a great. One. I think that I think they actually might have taken that picture from whoever took it and put it in the Sports Illustrated. I thought I saw that in Sports Illustrated too. Isn't that the most amazing thing? How can you put that much torque on your ankle? and his lean? Remember his? Oh lean, yeah, had that lean. Yeah, it was amazing. But that's Barry Sanders, though. <laughs> that time of the year, that time of the Lions' history, you were in the middle of it. It was probably the closest this team ever got. To getting to a Super yeah. Bowl, wasn't it? No doubt, no doubt, and we, it was a magic year, you know, for for many reasons, and also a tragic year for many reasons. That's when Mike Utley was injured, you know, broke his neck, and that summer is when Eric Andelsack passed, was run over by a truck and down died. in Louisiana, and also Lenny Fonz, Wayne's brother, died of a heart attack that that spring. But the season before, I mean, we'd never recapture that. And, and remember, Rodney Peake gets hurt in Game Five, our starting quarterback. And we're going like, oh, here goes the season. We're sitting there at, we might have been three and two or four, four and one at that point, or three and one going into the fifth game. We're playing the Cowboys, and Rodney goes down with a torn Achilles, and we're going, now what are we going to do? Eric Kramer goes in the game, and he takes us the rest of the way. 12 and four, championship beat Dallas in the first, in the, uh, in the, in the divisional game, and go on to, to play Washington and the championship. And, Unfortunately, you know they they, they had a, they had a magic year too, and they beat us pretty good. And they had a good team. You know? All those years, though, I asked Lomas this because we Lomas had a conversation, and he said the only thing that they he felt was missing was that they didn't have that trigger man. Yeah, yeah. No and do doubt. you do you agree with that? That 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 didn't get the Lions over the hump and into at least appearing in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I think that era, you know, and, and until really, if you look at it now, I mean, having. Matthew, who I think is a tremendous quarterback, and being around him for two or three years before I left, um, people underestimate how good he is and how tough that guy is. He's a tremendous player, but that was the, that was the the thing, and and you can't blame anybody in particular. We we went to Canada and got, you know, we got uh, Eric from Canada. We drafted first round players. Uh, you know, we had uh, the guy from Houston. Uh, thinking his name right now offhand, but. Uh, good player, but they just never never panned out. We went and got Scott Mitchell in free agency. You had a tremendous year in Miami the year before. He was the hottest quarterback in free agency and that year. He was year. only 27, I think. So uh, very frustrating. And uh, and it's not that they didn't play well. I mean, Scott Mitchell set the, the Lions record for passing yards at that point. You know, he threw for over 4,000 yards. Herman and uh, Herman had 100 catches. And, and well, he and led Brett, the league. Brett, Brett, yeah. Brett had 100. Herman led the league for three years, I think, in catches yeah. with Brett. And Johnny Morton was also a youngster. Oh, that's true. And, and then Crowell at the end. Right. You know, we had some really good players. Uh, but the thing, too, is you look around the, the division in those days, you know, we're with five teams, and you look at Green Bay, and they had that guy, number four, who was pretty good, Brett Favre. <laughs> and, uh, and then you look, in, and Minnesota was playing real well, and they had Cunningham, and then they got Dante Culpepper. And so they had quarterbacks, and not that our – trust me, our guys tried, as you know, and they were just a little bit better. And when we had our chances, we play up in Green Bay um, in a playoff game, and Barry is held at like two yards, I think the only time. And, the, and the, one of the plays, somebody had him by the ankle. If they don't touch him, he's gone. We win the game. Herman catches one across the back of the end zone. They call him out of bounds. It was a year they didn't have instant replay. They 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 tried it one year, then they took it out for a year, and they brought it back. I think he was in. I really do. But there was no no way to check it, and uh, it was just it was a frustrating time. But also, I mean, those of us who were there, we took a lot of pride in it because those guys really played hard, and they really played hard for Wayne, and they played hard for everybody. But. Uh, they liked Wayne, and they they liked Bobby too. Bobby had a different style, you know, and 
and he gets blamed for a lot of things. Well, you know, he should have done it this way. He, he should have been more of a people person. Bobby was fine. In fact, he was a great guy to work for. He was he's a play, he was a he was a coach's coach, I'll tell you that. He stood up for you. Yep. He really did. And and I admire the man. He was really a very strong coach. And I always thought when Bobby retired or kind of just said, I've had enough and, and Mo came in, Gary yep. Moeller, who I love oh, because he too. coached at Michigan and, and you talk about a coach's coach and a guy yep. that relates so much to players. And and Mo coached the end of that year and you got beat the end of that year by Paul Edinger hitting a 52-yard field goal that got you out of the playoffs, and that changed everything, did not it? Yeah, and it was, poor Mo never had a shot. No, and you know, it's a shame because Gary Moeller is, like you said, there are a few people that you look around and say, when he's 80, he's going to be coaching football somewhere because yeah. that's how he is. And he loved to coach, and the players loved him. The linebackers, I mean, he coached, and I worked with the linebackers too. So I saw him every day. Those guys would – do anything for him and the whole team would and they really responded well and I have to tell you you know Matt Millen and I are friends and I know he's gotten a bad rap here in Michigan too but I've known Matt since he was about 15 or 16 because I'm from that area I mean I'm he's from Whitehall I'm from Northampton in, in the Lehigh Valley and so um Matt told me at the night he was let go he was in my office we were the only two there it was during bye week and and he was going home the next day and he did go home the next day. <laughs> and but, didn't come back. Yeah, but but he told – so he knew he was fired. Howie Long had called him on the phone in his office, and he comes down, and he's talking to me, and he's telling me what, what's going on. And I said, I said, man, I don't believe that. But he said, you know, the bit – we talked about the whole thing, you know, on and off about what happened, what should what he should have done. Or, and, hey, I don't know what he should have done. But he told me, he said, the biggest mistake he made was not keeping Gary Moeller – and letting him have the year and kind of get his feet on the ground too. Because remember, he didn't have any experience. And you don't ever want to give a guy – I mean, he, he he had that position for a number of years, and we couldn't get it done. So he takes the blame for it, and he, he does feel bad about it. You know, and in fact, he, he, had, he had an opportunity to go with Oakland with Mr. Davis after that, and he asked me, he said, Clem, would you come with me? I said, I said Matt, I'll tell you what, if you go there, I'll go with you. He said, but if I were you – I would think twice about it because Mr. Davis is your friend. And you and you know darn well that he's not doing real well health wise. And also you're gonna have you guys are gonna butt heads and he's not gonna be your friend anymore. Do you wanna have a friend or do you wanna have a job? He said, It's the only job I ever failed at. He said, I was national champ in college. I went to the Super Bowl four or five times. He he said, This is the only thing I truly have ever failed at. I said Matt, a lot of people fail. I said, it isn't the end of the world. And so, uh, tremendous guy. I mean, really, I mean, Jim, you know what a oh. person he was. Tremendous I mean, hey, person. If he were sitting here next to us, he would laugh. He'd be one of the, he'd be the most popular guy in the room. Yep. Matt Millen is that kind of guy. I, I always thought, you know, his, his performance is colored kind of his uh, reputation. Yeah. Especially and and that's a Michigan. shame yeah. here in Michigan. Elsewhere, he's all right. And, yeah. and guy, I'm so glad he got out of his health problem and he got a new oh, heart. Yeah. Yes. And he's still around because football <laughs> and, and life needs that guy. He is. A, uh, people who know him. Whether, a whether, you're De- yeah, whether you're a Detroit Lion fan, I'm, I, I don't care. This guy is a good guy and, and he's worth hanging around. The, the other thing is, again, going back to the coaches, you know, Matt came in and, and the three M's, I call them, were the yep. next coaches. You had Morningweg, Mariucci, and Marinelli. True. And and Marty came in. The bar is high thing will always yeah. live in uh, infamy. I felt bad for him. Yeah. <laughs> and and yet here he is, a, a great coordinator. He's still in the league, still coaching. And so is Marinelli. But those guys look like they were born to be assistant coaches, but the head coaching thing didn't work for them. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. And I think with Marty, I mean, it, it was a shame because he gets thrown in and he's got a brand new – president, general manager, whatever you want to call it, brand new personnel director, a brand new organization. And, you know, he comes from San Francisco where they were very successful. And I don't know, when you come into an organization, I think when you're the head guy, a lot of times you think, I can do this by myself. Don't worry about it. We're going to get it done. And I think he was had one hand behind his back a little bit when he first came in. I like Marty a lot. And uh, there were times I think maybe – He'd been given some bad advice, you know, here and there within the organization and also from some of the coaches. 
And uh, and he, like you said, he's a tremendous coach, and he really is. And and he did start off the bar as high. And I said, oh, that I don't know if I would have started that way. And, <laughs> and at that time, I'd been in Detroit for a number of years, so I'm going like, I don't know if that's the way I would start it. And and really, Steve, we had a chance, but there again, we ran into the quarterback situation. And and you know, uh, you know, he brought in his guy from San Francisco, and then we, you know. We drafted uh, the young guy out of Oregon, and and he struggled. And I really think if we didn't throw him in there right away, he might. That have was been, Joey oh, Harrington. Yeah, Joey. Yeah. It, it might have been different, but we had to put him in there. And remember the first game, I think he and Charles Rogers are together against Arizona. Here they lit it up, and I'm going. I saw Mister Ford after the game, and he and he looked at me. and says, "What do you think?" I said, "I don't know. Maybe we're onto something here." And a couple games later, <laughs> Charles we were, breaks his <laughs> collarbone yeah. and. It, it, it went away. And actually, I think that breaking that Cabo not only ruined his career, but pr- maybe ruined his life. Yeah. Because he never... He never really came back. You no, know, he went back home, and he got involved with some of his buddies. And it, it's a shame. He was really a good guy. Too. Yeah, he was. Yeah, I, I thought he was. Um, And and then Marinelli comes in, and, and Rod has an 0-16 year. Yeah. At the time, the first ever if, unwinning team, yeah. not, a team that never won a game. Don, you and I both went through that. Yeah. Uh, how how I mean it was difficult for me as a broadcaster. Oh, as a manager a coach, the frustration had to be palpable. Yeah, and, and there were a couple games where you recall there were a couple very questionable calls. Oh, we should, uh, Minnesota was one up there. Well, Minnesota was one up there. Calvin was I think, wasn't it Calvin? Ball on his chest. Ball on his chest. And he actually what, had the ball, it was there, he was down, and they ruled it an interception or not a catch. Not a catch. Which yeah. was stupid because that would have given him a first down. And then I think later on Again, down the sideline somewhere. Yeah, interference. In a, uh, interference call. Yeah. It was just there were two calls, and I know those those this team was not going to win a lot of games. No, no, we weren't very good. But th- no. this team was not a team that couldn't win a game. No, no, we were, I mean, our, sure, we went through five quarterbacks, I think, so <laughs> that's not a good thing. But uh, but no, it was not that. But I'll tell you something about that season. People ask me, all the, oh, it had to be horrible. If it wouldn't have been for Rod Marinelli, that would have been a completely – I mean, it's one of those where you just feel so miserable. But that guy, how do you? Why do you say that? He kept everybody together, and he told the we we you know you meet every day with the the players, and and he told them the one time he says, guys, look, he says we're struggling here. If you don't want to play, get in the back of the boat. We'll keep rowing, because that's what we're going to do. Because that's what we do. And we had some guys who kind of bagged it on us, in my opinion, and we also had some coaches I think who kind of bagged it on us, and I was really disappointed in a few people. But one thing, Rod never would give up. And every every Friday he made he made each one of us coaches, we had a day, one Friday, where we talked to the team. And it was really interesting. And you you would see certain people, how they spoke to the team and how they responded. And it's nerve-wracking. I mean, head coaches are good. you got to get in front of those guys every day and talk to them. And, and when you got to go up there in front of them, they're looking at you like, who is this guy? Who is this Clemens guy? <laughs> Unfortunately, you get to, you know, you, I, I worked the scout teams. I always ran, so I knew everybody really well. So it was interesting. And, and who was the, did you work through Schwartz and then Caldwell? A couple. No, I never made the Caldwell. Never I, made it I, to Caldwell. You got three years with Jim and then I left. Okay. Yeah, I, I think he stayed two more. Yeah, and Jim came in and, and basically got the team off the dime yeah. for, by winning a game or so. Yeah. And then we, didn't we win like the last three games that yeah. first season? That we first went down season. to Miami and beat them. And then, in a surprising win, I think. Yeah, yeah but, and everybody got really kind of excited about Jim Swartz. Yeah. Then the next year, kind of same thing happened. Yeah. You couldn't get off the diamond. It was kind of a 500 kind of year, one yeah. six, lost nine, you know, whatever. And that, that's where the Lions were, and they seemed to get into this rut. Yeah, and then we, I think, the, my last year, we got to the playoffs and we lost down in, in New Orleans. Yep. And we might have won 10 that year. I don't think we won 11. And then I said, you know, the Lions, may, we may, they may be ready to go now because we had Matt. We had a good defense, you know. We had we had drafted some good players on defense, and and uh, Gunther was a, the coordinator, tremendous coach, and uh, I thought we were right there, and uh, you know, like anything else, things kind of slip away, and and well, you, the other thing too is in our division, you're playing Aaron Rodgers is one of the best players, you know, you're going to see, and it's it's never an excuse, but it they just had some really good players, and we couldn't get past them. You know, and of course we had that. I don't know how many we lost in a row up there. You know, ask so. you. You say that, and I say, ask everybody else in the AFC East, exactly. and they'll yeah. say, "They say, you know what? Yeah. We played 
the same time that Tom Brady was the quarterback. Yeah. Or ask anybody that was when Tiger Woods was at his prime. Exactly. I was playing the same time Tiger Woods was, and you're not going to win as many with no. those guys being your competitor. No, and, and, you know, really, it's amazing to watch those guys when, when you're playing them, and you go into that game, and you know what you have to do to have a chance to win. And you know what we have to do on offense to have a chance. When I'm speaking from the defensive side, he said, all right, well, we got we to gotta limit Aaron Rodgers. We can't, we're not going to stop him. So how are we going to do that? So he said, oh, well, we're going to play this coverage and take care of this receiver. We're going to do that to take care of this runner. And then you get in the game, and you're going, you see the runner go for 15 yards. You're going like, man, and plus they still have Aaron Rodgers. We, we're not worrying about stopping him, but we got to stop these other guys. <laughs> And that's when you just start going, oh, man, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Talked a lot about the coaches and how you've dealt with them over the years. About the players, the, the, the guys that you mentioned, Benny Blades, you mentioned Chris Spielman, yeah. some of the truly great ones. I mean, Robert Porsche was oh, another lineman. tremendous player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And Barry. Uh, <laughs> Calvin was another one of those oh. great ones. Over, the, over your years, I know I, you'll forget one or two, but oh, who yeah. are the ones that really, really stand out? Well, I mean, you, you mentioned Calvin, and I'll just tell you a story about Calvin. And I, I've, I've never seen this. We're in practice, and I'm running the defensive scout team. So the offense is, is going. So, you know, we got uh, Matthew throwing the ball, and Calvin's running routes. And, you know, we're running our offense. And so we're assimilating whatever team we were playing their defense. And I'm on the sideline standing right next to Gunther after showing the guys – the, the, the card to use on defense. And Calvin comes streaking across the middle on a route about 12 yards deep, and Matthew threw a bad pass. It had to be below his knee. Calvin caught that ball running full speed with one hand and just kept right on going. I mean, full speed. And I know you see uh, the guy Beckham jump up in the air and turn around all that. This was full speed across the middle, not stopping, jumping in the air. He never broke stride. And I looked at Gunther and I said, he looked at me, I said, Gun, I don't know. He says, I've been coaching longer than you, Clemens, and I've never seen anything like that. But what makes that amazing also, that was a big man, Calvin Johnson, oh, doing yeah, that. Yeah, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a 5'10 guy no, reaching down no. below his knees. He was a full 6'5". Oh, he yes, was 235 yes. pounds. And ripped. And hard. To reach down that low no, and that's... keep running like that. That was remarkable. What an athlete. Yeah, and, and what a tremendous guy. I mean, his parents raised that guy up right. And I'll tell you what, he very polite guy. And I have to tell you, my son was the uh, was one of the equipment managers during the summer. Well, he's a quarterback, and they brought him in so he could throw because I guess the receiver coach couldn't throw very well. So Corey would go with the receivers, and he would – he had the best summer job. He said, Dad, I got the best summer <laughs> job ever. I get to throw passes to Calvin Johnson and to all the other guys they had. And he said, Calvin would stay out after practice, and I would stay out there with him for 15 minutes and throw different different kind of routes, you know, like running down the middle. He said, now, Corey, throw it behind me so I have to turn around. And, and so he was working on things that he was going to have to do in game. And Corey said, the guy was just so – polite to me he says well am i i'm just a i'm a second year college guy throwing passes to calvin johnson that's why he was one of the best ever yeah because no he doubt. did that yeah now here's the other thing about don clements uh you retired from the nfl but you're still coaching but you're coaching football in europe yeah it's it's now where did that come from all right well i knew they played in europe because brock olivo who used to play for us as you remember running back right well when he retired he went back to he's he's italian he went to Milan to get his master's degree. I don't know why, but Brock's a different kind of guy. And he started the football team there. And they've already been playing. They've been playing football in Europe, American football, for 30 years. But So he says, you should go over there sometime. So I said, yeah, I was down at coaching at Moravian, and I decided, you know, I'm going to try to get to Europe. So Bert Hill, our old defensive line coach, he calls me. We're talking one day, and he said, call Carlos Baraccio who's with us at SMU. So I call Carlos, and Carlos calls, these are the greatest names, Jim. They're in Switzerland. Giorgio Volpe <laughs> and Fulgenzio Giorgio. And so they asked me to come over and help coach the national team, the junior national team who were playing in the, in the European championships. So I said, yeah, why not? Never been to Switzerland. Don't know how to speak Swiss. Giorgio goes, we're on Skype, and Giorgio goes, there is no Swiss language. I said, what do you mean? 
He says, we have the French section, the Italian section, the German section. And then we have this language, language called Romance, which is Latin. He says, not many people speak that, but everybody in our country speaks all three languages, plus English. Holy cow. Yeah, they're, they're, they're multilingual. They're not well, even bilingual. And I speak barely speak English, as, as you know. <laughs> and so anyway, I go over there, and one thing leads to another. So I've been going over there for two and a half years now. What is it like? I mean, is this starting from the beginning, the basics, fundamentals, or... Or do you have, you know, some guys that know what, are you, what they're doing so you can coach oh, yeah. them up? Oh, yeah. Well, they have professional leagues all through Europe now. Uh, I think there's 54 countries in Europe, someone told me, and 40 of them have leagues, actually organized leagues with 8, eight to 12 teams. I think in Germany they have 24 teams, two 12-team leagues. And Germ the, the German league is probably the best. The Austrians are probably next, then maybe the French are in there and uh, – Switzerland, we're, we're just really, we're, we're very average. But those other ones are, are real. But, yeah, there's a Swiss league, and there are, uh, what they have is they have their professional team, which is 20 and above, and then there's a U19 team, and then there's usually a 16 and below team and a flag team. And some of them have women's teams, like Kalanda, who is the perennial champ in Switzerland. They have a, a group of women who I got to coach at a, at a, at a camp. It no was kidding. great. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um. How how good are they? I mean, are they like small okay. college teams? Give me a, a, a kind no, of. No, I, I would say, Jim, what they're, what they're they're really like, and I get that question all the time, especially with the U nineteen guys. Um, I I tell them this: they have the skills, but they don't don't practice because they're club teams. There are no there are no sports in any of their high schools. No sports. No, they you have to join a club like soccer, hockey, whatever you want to play. You have to be in a club, and so. They practice at night because the senior team, the guys who are the professionals, theoretically, they all work jobs. Then they come home at night and you practice. You practice at seven from seven to ten, three days a week. And then you play on Saturday or Sunday. So I always tell them the difference is these guys don't have the repetitions. They don't have the chance. They don't have quarterbacks. So the senior teams can bring in so many foreign players. They get paid not a lot of money. Trust me, they usually get paid two thousand euros a month, which is nothing. And so. They, there's no quarterback development, and that's the hardest thing. But some of the, what they're trying to do now, a lot of guys try to come over to the States and play a year in high school. or So my suggestion is junior college. But the level of play, Jim, would be like probably a, a Division three team, an Adrian, and Albion, and they just don't have a lot of guys either. So the American team would win, but that's about the level. But there's some big dudes over there now. We played the German team in the – in the quarterfinals uh -huh. or in the, of the regional, and this is no exaggeration. Their left tackle was six foot ten. You're six kidding? Foot six ten. ten. They had a guy on defensive line who was six eight and one who was six six. And I said, "There's nobody six ten. They were telling me ahead of time. I stood by the gate when the guy walked in. He was six ten. How heavy? Uh, two hundred and sixty five pounds. So he's he, relatively thin. Well, he's he's over here playing in the states. Somewhere. Probably they don't have weight training either over there, do they? But, well, they do, but it's you're on your own. There's no there's no program. It's right. not like being in college, and uh, but it's exciting. They love it, and the kids. How they, many people did they get at the game? Oh, you might get a thousand, fifteen hundred. You know, I guess at the championship game in Switzerland last year they had, I think they had five thousand. They said, and uh, but it's they, they love it, and the, the, I'm telling you, these guys. They pay to play. They pay for their equipment. They get on a train. We'll will train for an hour and a half and get to the just to go to practice. It's there. It's phenomenal. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you also love coaching because you're not only doing Europe, but you're a small college football yeah. coach yeah. at Moravian, where your son played, and it's yeah. in the same league where you actually grew up, right? Yeah, I, I played at Muhlenberg, which uh -huh. is their arch rival, but Muhlenberg's. It's a different animal. In Division three, there are so many different levels as far as um, how much resources you have, what your resources are, your facilities. Moravian is probably, we're in a league of 10. We are probably the least expensive, which is still $50,000 a year. Um, our facilities are very average, not for any, by anybody's fault, but our endowment is also the lowest, and that's where the money is to operate your school. We play Johns Hopkins, who has one of the largest. In they're they're in the billions. Ours is, I want to say, ours is like sixteen million or something. So the the level is really different, you know. And uh, and so we struggle on that. I, I told Jeff last year, our head coach, 
It was really he's a good coach. Um, if if we could win five, I said out of ten, I said we'll be doing a heck of a job as coaches because we had a young team. We have a really good quarterback now. So and we had one when we won. We won the year we won eight. You know, but we couldn't get into the t- into the tournament because you got to play Hopkins and you're not going to beat Hopkins. And so uh, and so. I think these guys do a phenomenal job personally, and I have fun. It's a lot of fun for me. Here's the money shot. Don Clemens coached 27 years in the National Football League, the highest level, mm-hmm. uh, top gun, okay? Now you're out there in Europe teaching guys that, you know, don't really know how to play. They're semi-professional. They've got mm-hmm. jobs. And you also work Division Three football, and you're coaching. Yeah. Coaching is somewhere in your blood to the point where you can't get enough of it after all those years in Top Gun. In 30 seconds or a minute, Don, and I know this is probably impossible, tell me what it is about coaching. Well, it's not just coaching. It's football. Jim, I started playing when I was 10 at the Northampton Athletic Association in Northampton, Pennsylvania. I'm 65. I'm not real good in math. In fact, my dad says I'm a dumb. can't say the word, but he says I'm dumb. He's an engineer. Now, I had that. That's 55 years. I've never had a job in my life. I've been in football my whole life. I've made all my money playing, coaching football. It's crazy. But uh, it's some of it's tragic, some of it's magic. But I've had a good run all the way. Just the like thing would is, is that uh, it's like me when I've worked in football and I yeah. do something I love. They say if you do something you love, you don't work a day in your life. And you are so passionate about it. And I think that's the difference. And you're also, I think, to some degree, an educator and a teacher because you constantly teach the same thing, but the results that you get, I think, are what you appreciate more because of being a teacher. Is that the deal with a coach? No, I I think you're right. The result, you look at what's happening, and it's never, never, it's, it's two plus two doesn't always equal four. You know, it's one of those deals. And it just, but it's, you're right. When you look at the final product and you watch somebody, the neatest thing, Jim, I'll tell you, I had this kid playing from Switzerland. We're playing in a game against the Netherlands. In the, uh, we're playing for third place. And, uh, and he's playing linebacker. And I tell him, I said, look, now when that quarterback does this, I want you to just drop a little bit further to the, where the numbers are. I said, just tell. And he, he does ju- just what I said. He intercepts a pass. From, and he runs over and he goes, hey, what you told me worked. I said, yo, well, that's why I told you to do it. I said, it's not magic, you know. But it was funny. That's when you really know it. And I've seen Charlie Sanders, the late, great Charlie Sanders, tell Sloan one time, David Sloan, David, when this happens, do this, turn your head this way, turn back, and the guy will fall off you'll catch the ball. And he did it in practice. He came over and said, Charlie, he said, that really worked. Said, Charlie says, well, I did it forever, and I'm just telling you what works. Said, what do you think? I'm going to tell you something doesn't work. But it's funny when somebody goes, Wow, it really worked. I said, yeah, well, that's why we do it. <laughs> Don, you're a delight. Thank you so much for being with us. Jim, it's been my pleasure. As you know, we're good friends, and this is fun. I, I think you got, you're on to something cool. I know, and I didn't even get to talk about you and I sitting in press boxes three hours before games well, we could, having a cup of coffee. We could do it again. We don't just have to have one. I mean, if you think of something else you want to talk about, I'm always here. You know that. Maybe next season we'll come back and yeah. we'll do more with Don Clemens. Hey, love to, Jim. Thanks. I had so much fun with Don Clements. He's a great guy, has an unbelievable resume in coaching, and is as passionate about the game of football as he was when he started this journey as a coach. He's still having a blast in semi-retirement as anyone I've ever seen, and I couldn't be happier for him. Be sure and keep up to date on my episodes of Conversations With by visiting my Facebook page, Jim Brandstatter 76 my Twitter account, at Jim Brandstatter, and at thebrandyshow.com.